Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the February 2021 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook of What is Socialist Feminism by Barbara Ehrenreich from 1976. If you like this video, please click the like button and the subscribe button and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks, as usual, to the Marxists Internet Archive at Marxists.org. Please also support them if you can. Let's get into the file. So there is a note on this file from Marxists Internet Archive. This article was first published in Wynn Magazine in 1976. It later appeared in Working Papers on Socialism and Feminism, published by the New American Movement, or NAM, in 1976. NAM was a mixed gender organization heavily influenced by socialist feminism. A number of CWLUers were associated with it. Let's get into the text itself. At some level, perhaps not too well articulated, socialist feminism has been around for a long time. You're a woman in a capitalist society. You get pissed off about the job, about the bills, about your husband or ex-husband, about the kid's school, the housework, being pretty, not being pretty, being looked at, not being looked at, and either way, not listened to, etc. If you think about all these things and how they fit together and what has to be changed, and then you look around for some words to hold all these thoughts together in abbreviated form, you'd almost have to come up with socialist feminism. A lot of us came to socialist feminism in just that kind of way. We were searching for a word, term, phrase, which would begin to express all of our concerns, all of our principles, in a way that neither socialist nor feminist seem to. I have to admit that most socialist feminists I know are not too happy with the term socialist feminist either. On the one hand, it is too long. I have no hopes for a hyphenated mass movement. On the other hand, it is much too short for what is, after all, really socialist, internationalist, anti-racist, anti-heterosexist feminism. The trouble with taking a new label of any kind is that it creates an instant aura of sectarianism. Socialist feminism becomes a challenge, a mystery, an issue in and of itself. We have speakers, conferences, articles on socialist feminism, though we know perfectly well that both socialism and feminism are too huge and too inclusive to be subjects for any sensible speech, conference, article, etc. People, including avowed socialist feminists, ask themselves anxiously, what is socialist feminism? There is a kind of expectation that it is or is about to be at any moment, maybe in the next speech, conference, or article. A brilliant synthesis of world historical proportions, an evolutionary leap beyond Marx, Freud, and Wollstonecraft. Or that it will turn out to be nothing, a fad seized on by a few disgruntled feminists and female socialists, a temporary distraction. I want to try to cut through some of the mystery which has grown up around socialist feminism. A logical way to start is to look at socialism and feminism separately. How does a socialist, more precisely a Marxist, look at the world? How does a feminist? To begin with, Marxism and feminism have an important thing in common. They are critical ways of looking at the world. Both rip away popular mythology and common sense wisdom and force us to look at experience in a new way. Both seek to understand the world, not in terms of static balances, symmetries, etc., as in conventional social science, but in terms of antagonisms. They lead to conclusions which are jarring and disturbing at the same time that they are liberating. There is no way to have a Marxist or feminist outlook and remain a spectator. To understand the reality laid bare by these analyses is to move into action to change it. Marxism addresses itself to the class dynamics of capitalist society. Every social scientist knows that capitalist societies are characterized by more or less severe systemic inequality. Marxism understands this inequality to rise from processes which are intrinsic to capitalism as an economic system. A minority of people, the capitalist class, own all the factories, energy sources, resources, etc., which everyone else depends on in order to live. The great majority, the working class, must work out of sheer necessity, under conditions set by the capitalists, for the wages the capitalists pay. 
since the capitalists make their profits by paying less in wages than the value of what the workers actually produce, the relationship between the two classes is necessarily one of irreconcilable antagonism. The capitalist class owes its very existence to the continued exploitation of the working class. What maintains the system of class rule is, in the last analysis, force. The capitalist class controls, directly or indirectly, the means of organized violence represented by the state, police, jails, etc., only by waging a revolutionary struggle aimed at the seizure of state power can the working class free itself and ultimately all people. Feminism addresses itself to another familiar inequality. All human societies are marked by some degree of inequality between the sexes. If we survey human societies at a glance, sweeping through history and across continents, we see that they have commonly been characterized by the subjugation of women to male authority, both with the family and the community in general, the objectification of women as a form of property, a sexual division of labor in which women are confined to such activities as child raising, performing personal services for adult males, and specified, usually low prestige forms of productive labor. Feminists, struck by the near universality of these things, have looked for explanations in the biological givens which underlie all human social existence. Men are physically stronger than women on the average, especially compared to pregnant women or women who are nursing babies. Furthermore, men have the power to make women pregnant. Thus, the forms that sexual inequality take, however various they may be from culture to culture, rest, in the last analysis, on what is clearly a physical advantage males hold over females. That is to say, they result ultimately on violence or the threat of violence. The ancient biological root of male supremacy, the fact of male violence, is commonly obscured by the laws and conventions which regulate the relations between the sexes in any particular culture. But it is there, according to a feminist analysis. The possibility of male assault stands as a constant warning to bad i.e. rebellious or aggressive women, and drives, quote, good women into complicity with male supremacy. The reward for being good, pretty, submissive, etc., is protection from random male violence, and, in some cases, economic security. Marxism rips away the myths about democracy and its pluralism to reveal a system of class rule that rests on forcible exploitation. Feminism cuts through myths about instinct and romantic love to expose male rule as a rule of force. Both analyses compel us to look at a fundamental injustice. The choice is to reach for the comfort of the myths, or, as Marx put it, to work for a social order that does not require myths to sustain it. It is possible to add up Marxism and feminism and call the sum socialist feminism. In fact, this is probably how most socialist feminists see it most of the time, as a kind of hybrid, pushing our feminism in socialist circles, our socialism in feminist circles. One trouble with leaving things like that, though, is that it keeps people wondering, well, what is she really? Or demanding of us, what is the principal contradiction? These kinds of questions, which sound so compelling and authoritative, often stop us in our tracks. Make a choice. Be one or the other. But we know that there is a political consistency to socialist feminism. We are not hybrids or fence-sitters. To get to that political consistency, we have to differentiate ourselves as feminists from other kinds of feminists, and as Marxists from other kinds of Marxists. We have to stake out a, pardon the terminology here, socialist feminist kind of feminism, and a socialist feminist kind of socialism. Only then is there a possibility that things will add up to something more than an uneasy juxtaposition. I think that most radical feminists and socialist feminists would agree with my capsule characterization of feminism as far as it goes. The trouble with radical feminism from a socialist feminist point of view is that it doesn't go any further. It remains transfixed with the universality of male supremacy, 
Things have never really changed. All social systems are patriarchies. Imperialism, militarism, and capitalism are all simply expressions of innate male aggressiveness, and so on. The problem with this, from a socialist feminist point of view, is not only that it leaves out men and the possibility of reconciliation with them on a truly human and egalitarian basis, but that it leaves out an awful lot about women. For example, to discount a socialist country such as China as a patriarchy, as I have heard radical feminists do, is to ignore the real struggles and achievements of millions of women. Socialist feminists, while agreeing that there is something timeless and universal about women's oppression, have insisted that it takes different forms in different settings, and that the differences are of vital importance. There is a difference between a society in which sexism is expressed in the form of female infanticide, and a society in which sexism takes the form of unequal representation on the Central Committee. And that difference is worth dying for. One of the historical variations on the theme of sexism which ought to concern all feminists is the set of changes that came with the transition from an agrarian society to industrial capitalism. This is no academic issue. The social system which industrial capitalism replaced was in fact a patriarchal one, and I'm using that term now in its original sense to mean a system in which production is centered in the household and is presided over by the oldest male. The fact is that industrial capitalism came along and tore the rug out from under patriarchy. Production went into the factories, and individuals broke off from the family to become, quote, free wage earners. To say that capitalism disrupted the patriarchal organization of production and family life is not, of course, to say that capitalism abolished male supremacy. But it is to say that the particular forms of sex oppression we experience today are, to a significant degree, recent developments. A huge historical discontinuity lies between us and true patriarchy. If we are to understand our experience as women today, we must move to a consideration of capitalism as a system. There are obviously other ways I could have gotten to the same point. I could have simply said that as feminists, we are most interested in the most oppressed women, poor and working class women, third world women, etc., and for that reason, we are led to a need to comprehend and confront capitalism. I could have said that we need to address ourselves to the class system simply because women are members of classes. But I'm trying to bring out something else about our perspective as feminists. There is no way to understand sexism as it acts on our lives without putting it in the historical context of capitalism. I think most socialist feminists would also agree with the capsule summary of Marxist theory as far as it goes. And the trouble again is that there are a lot of people, I'll call them mechanical Marxists, who do not go any further. To these people, the only quote real and important things that go on in capitalist society are those things that relate to the productive process or the conventional political sphere. From such a point of view, every other part of experience and social existence, things having to do with education, sexuality, recreation, the family, art, music, housework, you name it, is peripheral to the central dynamics of social change. It is part of the superstructure or culture. Socialist feminists are in a very different camp from what I am calling mechanical Marxists. We, along with many, many Marxists who are not feminists, see capitalism as a social and cultural totality. We understand that in its search for markets, capitalism is driven to penetrate every nook and cranny of social existence. Especially in the phase of monopoly capitalism, the realm of consumption is every bit as important, just from an economic point of view, as the realm of production. So we cannot understand class struggle as something confined to issues of wages and hours or confined only to workplace issues. Class struggle occurs in every arena where the interests of classes conflict, and that includes education, health, art, music, etc. We aim to transform not only the ownership of the means of production, but the totality of social existence. As Marxists, we come to feminism from a completely different place than the mechanical Marxists. Because we see monopoly capitalism as a political, economic, cultural totality, we have room within our Marxist framework for feminist issues 
which have nothing ostensibly to do with production or politics. Issues that have to do with the family, health care, quote, private life. Furthermore, in our brand of Marxism, there is no woman question because we never compartmentalized women off to the superstructure or somewhere in the first place. Marxists of a mechanical bent continually ponder the issue of the unwaged woman, the housewife. Is she really a member of the working class? That is, does she really produce surplus value? We say, of course housewives are members of the working class, not because we have some elaborate proof that they really do produce surplus value, but because we understand a class as being composed of people and as having a social existence quite apart from the capitalist-dominated realm of production. When we think of class in this way, then we see that, in fact, the women who seemed most peripheral, the housewives, are at the very heart of their class, raising children, holding together families, maintaining the cultural and social networks of the community. We are coming out of a kind of feminism and a kind of Marxism whose interests quite naturally flow together. I think we are in a position now to see why it is that socialist feminism has been so mystified. The idea of socialist feminism is a great mystery or paradox, so long as what you mean by socialism is really what I have called mechanical Marxism, and what you mean by feminism is an ahistorical kind of radical feminism. These things just don't add up, they have nothing in common. But if you put together another kind of socialism and another kind of feminism, as I have tried to define them, you do get some common ground, and that is one of the most important things about socialist feminism today. It is a space free from the constrictions of a truncated kind of feminism and a truncated version of Marxism, in which we can develop the kind of politics that addresses the political, economic, cultural totality of monopoly capitalist society. We could only go so far with the available kinds of feminism, the conventional kind of Marxism, and then we had to break out to something that is not so restrictive and incomplete in its view of the world. We had to take a new name, socialist feminism, in order to assert our determination to comprehend the whole of our experience and to forge a politics that reflects the totality of that comprehension. However, I don't want to leave socialist feminist theory as a, quote, space or a common ground. Things are beginning to grow in that ground. We are closer to a synthesis in our understanding of sex and class, capitalism and male domination than we were a few years ago. Here I will indicate only very sketchily one such line of thinking. 1. The Marxist feminist understanding that class and sex domination rest ultimately on force is correct. And this remains the most devastating critique of sexist capitalist society. But there is a lot to that word, ultimately. In a day-to-day -day sense, most people acquiesce to sex and class domination without being held in line by the threat of violence, and often without even the threat of material deprivation. 2. It is very important, then, to figure out what it is if not the direct application of force that keeps things going. In the case of class, a great deal has been written already about why the U.S. working class lacks militant class consciousness. Certainly ethnic divisions, especially the black and white division, are a key part of the answer. But I would argue, in addition to being divided, the working class has been socially atomized. Working class neighborhoods have been destroyed and are allowed to decay. Life has become increasingly privatized and inward-looking. Skills once possessed by the working class have been expropriated by the capitalist class, and capitalist-controlled, quote, mass culture has edged out almost all indigenous working class culture and institutions. Instead of collectivity and self-reliance as a class, there is mutual isolation and collective dependency on the capitalist class. Point three, the subjugation of women in the ways which are characteristic of late capitalist society, has been key to this process of class atomization. To put it another way, the forces which have atomized working class life and promoted cultural and material dependence on the capitalist class are the same forces which have served to perpetuate the subjugation of women. It is women who are most isolated in what has become an increasingly privatized family existence, even when they work outside the home as well. It is in many key instances women's skills, 
productive skills, healing, midwifery, etc., which have been discredited or banned to make way for commodities. It is, above all, women who are encouraged to be utterly passive, uncritical, dependent, i.e., quote, feminine, in the face of the pervasive capitalist penetration of private life. Historically, late capitalist penetration of working-class life has singled out women as prime targets of pacification, or feminization, because women are the culture-bearers of their class. Point four, it follows that there is a fundamental interconnection between women's struggle and what is traditionally conceived as class struggle. Not all women's struggles have an inherently anti-capitalist thrust, particularly not those which seek only to advance the power and wealth of special groups of women. But all those which build collectivity and collective confidence among women are vitally important to the building of class consciousness. Conversely, not all class struggles have an inherently anti-sexist thrust, especially not those that cling to pre-industrial patriarchal values. But all those which seek to build the social and cultural autonomy of the working class are necessarily linked to the struggle for women's liberation. This, in very rough outline, is one direction which socialist feminist analysis is taking. No one is expecting a synthesis to emerge which will collapse socialist and feminist struggle into the same thing. The capsule summaries I gave earlier retain their, quote, ultimate truth. There are crucial aspects of capitalist domination, such as racial oppression, which a purely feminist perspective simply cannot account for or deal with, at least without bizarre distortions. There are crucial aspects of sex oppression, such as male violence within the family, which socialist thought has little insight into, again, not without a lot of stretching and distortion. Hence the need to continue to be socialists and feminists. But there is enough of a synthesis, both in what we think and what we do, for us to begin to have a self-confident identity as socialist feminists. And that is the end of the audiobook, Standing ovation from me, I think Barbara Ehrenreich writing this in 1976, pretty much right on the cusp of the death of social democracy, that golden age from the New Deal to, you know, just about uh, the, the beginning of the Reagan years, late 70s, writing this at the cusp of the neoliberal turn, the project to dismantle the social welfare state and privatize, like just go crazy, you know, uh, prepare for bringing down the Soviet Union and uh, globalization, global, you know, spreading, air quotes, free market, intense hyper-capitalism around the world um, through the 90s and then the war on terror, which of course is a war for corporate profits in the 2000s. Um, writing this at that time, this so well, I think, sums up uh, the dynamics which are still four decades later, uh, well, four and a half really, uh, in play today. Also, I'm going to be pinning this video um, as the, the pinned video for the channel. I think that this very much sums up a lot of my thoughts about what's been going on in the United States, the capitalist West, and the world generally, where, you know, even though every country is not capitalist, capitalism is still a significant force that any country has to reckon with, no matter what that country's, you know, political constitution and representation is. Um, trying to explain the position that we're at. I'm pretty shocked. Uh, I only started this channel about a year ago now. I am very shocked at the lack of feminist integration. I've considered myself a Marxist for some time and a feminist for some time, and I kind of assumed that that was the state of things for Marxists. Uh, very surprised to find out about the real lack of integration, and we're making a point of focus on the channel, uh, doing a lot more socialist feminist content. To me, um, you know, I, 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 this, this particular piece reflects my own line of thinking very clearly. I mean, I, I can't even really think of any um, quibbles I have with it, so... Again, I'll be pinning the video. What did you think? Leave a comment below. Um, really an outstanding job by Barbara Ehrenreich, who I had seen pieces from here and there before. Uh, she wrote a book called Nickel and Dimed that was about 
I believe it was about trying to live on minimum wage. Uh, and that was in the 2000s, I believe. And uh, so I'm, I w- was familiar with the existence of her work. This is actually the first time I have read any of it. And I um, think that this is an outstanding summary. And absolutely, absolutely where the Marxist left needs to go. There's a lot of Marxists out there who just are not asking a lot of the right questions about what she calls the economic, political, cultural totality of capitalism and how gender and sex oppression factors into that. Can't stress this enough. Um, And, you know, I guess to that point of not being able to stress enough, we'll be doing many, many, many videos on this through 2021. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in one of those future videos. And that's the video. Thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen or just support us financially, you can go to patreon.com slash socialism for all and sign up for a monthly donation. You can also follow us at facebook.com slash socialism, the number for all used to have a page at for all and it got throttled to death by Zuck here on YouTube. Please click the like button, subscribe button and the notifications bell. Please leave a comment if you can, and please share our video wherever you're online, your Twitter feed, your Discord servers, Reddit subs, etc. All of that helps more people to see this content, whether it's in the YouTube algorithm or just posting it on other sites. All of that's helpful. All of you out there supporting and promoting this content makes it all go that much more smoothly. We need to end capitalism, normalize talking about socialism today, and uh, it's really kind of our only hope for a better tomorrow. Thanks for all you do, and we will catch you in the next video.